Cutting Gaza in 2A, a siege is taking place in Gaza City, with the sea on one side and Israeli forces on the other three. According to a statement by the Israel Defense Forces, Gaza City, the largest city in the Gaza Strip historically, was under siege. Three sides have been under siege by Israeli forces, the northern part of the Gaza Strip, the Mediterranean Sea, and the city devastated by the conflict. Because Hamas and other militants are deprived of surface supplies, tunnels leading to regions outside the blockade can be found and destroyed. Hamas members are encircled after the IDF locates and destroys the tunnel's connecting link. Many Hamas members are eliminated as a result of IDF attacks, and those who survive find redemption by turning themselves into the IDF. However, the Israeli army and Hamas are engaged in combat outside of Gaza City as well. The IDF and Shin Bet carried out an operation against Hamas in the West Bank, according to a statement from the IDF. The IDF and Shin Bet detained a number of people during the operation on suspicion that they were involved in terrorist activity in Gush Etchen, including four people with ties to Hamas. During searches, Israeli security officers in the vicinity of the Palestinian hamlet of Bait Umar apprehended dozens of people and discovered military material. The IDF retaliated when Israeli forces came across obstructions and stone throwers during the operation. IDF and Shin Bet personnel were targeted by bombs hurled from the Palestinian town of Jaba. Weapons, including rockets and ammo, were seized at Alpha War. More firearms were seized in Bethlehem, along with a stolen motorcycle, a makeshift submachine gun, and ammunition. Additionally, given these circumstances, the battle appears to be getting more intense and may be a prelude to what happened last night as the IDF descended farther into the intricate urban sprawl of Gaza City, which is covered in debris. Large-scale airstrikes by the Israeli army and the lifting of the siege by ground forces split Gaza in two, with the territory now divided in two and the Strip's communications seemingly cut off once more. The Israel Defense Forces spokesperson, Rear Admiral Daniel Hagari, stated at a press conference this evening that the army has launched extensive strikes on Hamas facilities on both the surface and below. According to a Hamas spokesperson in Gaza, there has been heavy bombardment surrounding hospitals for over an hour. The chief of the Hamas government media office, Salama Marouf, claims that there has been especially intense shelling in the vicinity of Al-Shifa, the region's major hospital. Israel claims that Hamas' main operational base is located at the hospital. The intensification of the shelling occurred subsequent to the IDF's discovery of fresh intelligence, which it claimed offered more proof that Hamas is utilizing Gaza Strip medical facilities to conceal its terrorist operations. Hagari asserted that Hamas had placed troops and weapons inside, beneath, and around mosques, homes, schools, and UN structures without Israel's confirmation. The night sky was filled with fireworks and explosions, and Gazans once again experienced a communications blackout. A few hours after Hagari claimed that Israeli soldiers had divided the coastal enclave in half after fully surrounding Gaza City, Israel went dark. According to Hagari, there are now two areas in Gaza, the north and the south. He also stated that soldiers from the 36th Division's Gulani Brigade, which is in charge of reconnaissance, had reached and seized control of the coastal strip. Since the ground incursion in the Gaza Strip began a week ago, the IDF has targeted more than 2,500 targets from land, air, and sea, the army stated. The 36th Division, which is made up of troops, tanks, artillery, and combat engineers, was stated by the army to have targeted about 1,600 Hamas targets, including infrastructure, munitions stores, anti-tank missile positions, and observation posts. Despite Israel's Iron Dome missile defense shield, Hamas and other terror groups continued to fire rockets into Israel as the war raged, forcing over 200,000 Israelis to flee and causing extensive damage. The Israeli army and media outlets claim that during the IDF confrontation, Israel and Hezbollah traded blows, with Israel hitting Hezbollah bunkers in a rocket depot while Hezbollah unveiled a brand new, potent missile. 
The IDF also attacked Hezbollah cells along with one of the Israeli army's observation sites in Lebanon, the army claimed, adding that the strikes were in response to Hezbollah's recent attempts to fire into Israel from Lebanon. According to an accompanying video documenting the IDF attack, Hezbollah infrastructure in Lebanon was the target of IDF warplanes. The strikes were additional retaliation for the Hezbollah rocket fire attacking the Jewish state. According to the IDF, artillery and tank fire were fired in addition to the airstrikes. Hezbollah rocket stores, military installations, and other Hezbollah-utilized sites were among the infrastructure targets. Following multiple rocket launches from Lebanon earlier in the evening, the Israeli army launched airstrikes against Hezbollah's military facilities. The IDF spokesperson's unit stated that there weren't enough rockets. In the vicinity of Metula, an anti-tank missile was fired. There were no reported injuries from the attack. Hezbollah took credit for the anti-tank rocket assault. The Israel Defense Forces declared shortly after that the rocket sirens in Miss Gavim, close to the Israeli border with Lebanon, were a false alarm. According to a number of anonymous sources, Hezbollah launched an unprecedented and potent missile attack in its most recent assault. According to the source, the rocket struck an Israeli position in southern Lebanon, across the border from the villages of Eta Ashab and Ermich. What the missile struck and the extent of the damage it caused are still unknown. Meanwhile, there are mounting calls for a humanitarian suspension of hostilities in Gaza, although nothing seems real at the time. America When asked if there had been any progress on this happening remotely, President Joe Biden gave an affirmative response. Israel has not wavered in its demand for the unilateral release of all hostages before there is a truce. Anthony Blinken, the U.S. Secretary of State, started a fast-paced tour of the area, meeting with leaders to discuss the conflict's different facets and genuine worries that it might grow into something more. This includes a visit to Baghdad, where pro-Iranian militias frequently attack U.S. interests. The Secretary of State was pictured wearing a protective vest as he traveled to meet with the Prime Minister of Iraq to talk about the unsatisfactory security situation, particularly for U.S. forces stationed there. Blinken met with Abbas, the leader of the Palestinian Authority, prior to his trip to Iraq. He brought up a number of important topics, including the rising violence in the West Bank. He is currently on his way to Turkey, where Ankara and Israel's relations have reached a new low. The journey will be brief. His second trip to Turkey was made in February, following the terrible earthquakes that struck the nation. In the meantime, Turkey declared that it has called back its ambassador to Israel for talks regarding the ongoing conflict in Gaza and the worsening humanitarian situation in the area. The decision represents a significant deterioration in the two nations' diplomatic ties, which were mainly repaired with the handover of ambassadors last autumn. After a four-year hiatus Due to persistent anti-Israel riots in Turkey, Israel evacuated all of its diplomats last month, but it kept the departures a secret. Following weeks of growing criticism, Israeli Foreign Minister Eli Cohen declared last week that his nation was pulling its diplomats out of Turkey. Erdogan stated that severing diplomatic ties with Israel was not an option, hence, the recall of the ambassadors from the two nations signals a significant setback for the Turkish-Israeli settlement. It appears that the Middle East conflict is still upsetting global political equilibrium. This is a continuous narrative. The Israel Defense Forces have been wreaking havoc on Gaza territory for the past three days with all of their tanks and troops. All the same, Israel is facing an extremely difficult battle this time. When Israel attacked the Gaza Strip over 10 years ago, its soldiers decimated Hamas's armed forces. Previously, Israeli forces demolished terrorist tunnel networks and obstructed smuggling routes, resulting in the Islamist organization losing two-thirds of its missiles as they withdrew. Israel now faces a more formidable foe that is reassembling its weapons with Iranian assistance as it begins a new occupation. Hamas has been attacking the Israeli army since the beginning of the operation with high-impact rockets, anti-tank missiles, and drones loaded with explosives. 
These rockets have the same power as the armaments that Hamas has been using to change the landscape of the Ukrainian war. This explains why, despite suffering 26 fatalities in a single week of fighting, Israel has not yet emerged victorious. According to Avi Melamed, a former Israeli intelligence official, the number of Israeli deaths is more than twice as high as it was in 2014, a year in which 67 individuals lost their lives in a seven-week operation. This implies that Israel will need to get ready for a protracted conflict. Melamed claimed that Iran is to blame for Hamas' rise to prominence in the military. The Israeli army maintains close intelligence despite the strain. Israel's intelligence network, which it has been constructing like a spider's web for years, is actually one of its most powerful weapons. As is well known, the Israeli army attempts to launch the majority of its strikes in regions that are home to prominent Hamas terrorists. Today, the Israeli military behaved in the same manner. The home of exiled Hamas leader Ismail Henya is located in the Shadi refugee camp on the northern border of Gaza City, and it was the target of an airstrike according to the Hamas media office in Gaza. There was no immediate comment, nor were there any specifics provided regarding casualties or damage. According to senior Hamas official Ghazi Hamad, Honeye's two sons lived in the house. The house is situated on a little street in the refugee camp, which has grown over the years into a bustling area of Gaza City. Sweetheart. Yes. Since 2019, a former assistant to Hamas founder Ahmed Yassin, who was killed in an Israeli bombing in 2004, has lived in exile. Following Hania's targeting, Yov Gallant, the Minister of Defense, released a statement. By the end of the fight, our forces will have reached Yehya Sinwar, the chief of Hamas terror. There won't be Hamas in Gaza, and the Gaza Strip won't pose a security risk to Israel. Israel will be fully free to respond to any threats it faces with the necessary security measures. His comments coincide with Israel's stepping up of its ground campaign in Gaza over the weekend, during which it effectively targeted and destroyed crucial Hamas components, including personnel and infrastructure. Night strikes also occur around Al-Quds Hospital and the western edge of the city. Adli Abu Taha, a Gaza City resident who has been residing on the hospital grounds for the past three weeks, reported that the hospital has been the target of frequent shelling in recent days. According to Taha, the shelling is approaching every day. We have no idea where to go. Many thousands of Palestinians continue to reside in the northern part of Gaza as well as the city. Israel thinks that Hamas has established a substantial military network throughout the city, comprising a system of common centers, bunkers, and underground tunnels Israel maintains that all of its attacks are directed at Hamas. Israeli forces are currently besieging the city, and they are advising the populace to relocate south in order to stay out of the combat. Israel has persisted in attacking the south despite these warnings, claiming that the targets are Hamas members. In Gaza, though, the bombings are also killing families. Raid Matar, who earlier in the war fled N and sought safety in a school in the southern town of Khan Yunus, claimed to have heard explosions from airstrikes. People, according to Matter, never sleep. The detonations never cease. Approximately 1.5 million Palestinians, or 70% of Gaza's population, have reportedly left their homes, according to the UN. An airstrike earlier in the weekend caused damage to a family's home in the center of Khan Yunus. First responders extracted three dead bodies and six injured people from the debris. The videographer on the scene said that one of the deceased was a minor. The Israeli army reported that engineers and armored troops are currently attempting to remove booby traps from houses, while ground soldiers are also present in the south. Israeli soldiers killed fighters who were observed emerging from a tunnel during the operation, according to the army. The army added that the tunnels frequently launched attacks against Israeli forces in the northern Gaza Strip. Following the Israeli army's announcement that it had struck militant groups in Lebanon and a Hezbollah observation post that was attempting to launch an attack on Israel, fighting along Israel's northern border persisted throughout the weekend. 
There have been concerns about a new front developing in Lebanon because of the near-daily gunfire exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah, an ally of Hamas, along the Lebanese border during the war. Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, recently made his first speech in public since the beginning of the conflict. What Hassan Nasrallah did not say during his speech was just as significant as what he did say. At least not yet, there was no proclamation of total war against Israel. In Lebanon, nobody anticipated it. Nasrallah is aware of the lack of will in this nation to wage another conflict with its formidable neighbor. 2006 saw the most recent one. With a broken political system and a fractured economy, the Lebanese people already face enough challenges. This is a potent deterrent, especially when combined with the two U.S. aircraft carriers that were just stationed in the eastern Mediterranean. From an unidentified location, Hassan Nasrallah spoke via video hookup to the thousands of people gathered in a segregated rally. Not just his followers paid attention to what he said. Washington and Tel Aviv had to hear his address. It could be important what Hezbollah does or does not do at this point. The head of Hezbollah declared that all options were on the table and that a military confrontation could break out at any time. It would depend, he said, on Israel's stance toward Lebanon and its activities in Gaza. The Israeli army has dispatched troops to the area as a result of Hezbollah's increased cross-border operations, which are exerting more pressure on Israel. However, Hamas demands more of its ally. The ferocious priest appeared to be almost defensive at times regarding the actions of his fighters thus far. He stressed how significant and crucial what is going on on our end is. What is occurring on the border may seem insignificant to those who contend that Hezbollah needs to launch an immediate all-out war with the enemy. However, an objective view reveals that it is really enormous. There have been 57 Hezbollah fighter deaths in recent weeks. As expected, he left the door open for things to get worse. He continued, I promise you that this won't be the last. Hassan Nasrallah maintained that the early strikes by Hamas were solely Palestinian in nature. He went on to say that it has nothing to do with any national or international concern. He asserted that neither Iran nor he were aware of the original strike. Crowds gathered under the scorching sun during a rally in the southern suburbs of Beirut, chanting, We are with you, Nasrallah. There are signs that Hezbollah intends to hand the Gaza conflict over to Hamas for the time being. But if Hamas is on the verge of defeat, this assessment might swiftly be altered. The price of an Israeli triumph in Gaza may be a larger conflict with Hezbollah. You can click the super thanks button below and subscribe to our channel if you enjoy our videos. This will ensure that you don't miss any of the videos our team has prepared, including the most recent updates and special reports on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Israeli military has launched multiple air, naval, and land operations since the start of the conflict in an effort to totally demolish the terrorist group Hamas in Gaza, which is supported by Iran. The IDF has been conducting operations to divide the Gaza Strip in half most recently. The IDF attacked the northern boundaries of the Strip, which were Erez, Beit Hanun and Gaza. Eretzikim was the cornerstone of the corridor at this point. There was a Hamas naval organization on the coast near Zikim. Along the Gaza coast, the IDF has destroyed around 2,000 targets thus far. The southern flanks of the IDFS line of attack included Khan Yunus, Al Zara, and Nuzarat. The Israeli Defense Forces IDF, persisted in their efforts to obstruct the terrorist Hamas backed Iranian delivery of extra ammunition to Gaza through Rafah, leading up to Khan Yunus. Israel often conducted more bombing raids with its fighter jets. This is due to Khan Yunus's current unsuitability for the IDF to conduct direct, extensive ground offensive operations. This is due to the intricate tunnel system that Khan Yunus possesses. Despite all the risks, Hamas continues to grow. To date, the Israeli army has destroyed around 10,000 Hamas terror targets using its air power, special forces, navy, and intelligence capabilities. The recent ground onslaught by IDFS has increased Hamas's average daily casualties to over 300. 
The goal of each and every one of these IDF operations was to destroy the terrorist organizations that support Iran and Hamas, as well as the tunnel infrastructure in Gaza and the city structures that enable terrorism. Intelligence was essential for this. The fact that Iran funded terrorist groups like Hezbollah and Hamas underscored the value of the intelligence network in combat. In this area, Israel's Shin Bet and Mossad intelligence agencies have performed admirably. But these days, the IDF's intelligence services have started to employ a completely new tactic in combat. The Israeli army, working with Shin Bet and Mossad, attempted to extract vital intelligence information from hundreds of terrorists it had apprehended in order to free about 229 hostages and destroy Hamas's Gaza tunnel network and ammunition stockpiles. Today was the day that the joint IDFS effort paid off. Critical information regarding the location of the weapons cache Iran delivered to Hamas, the tunnel's entry and exit points, and the organization's headquarters was gathered by Israeli intelligence during the questioning of some of the Hamas militants who turned themselves into Israel. Following intelligence information received from the Shin Bet's interrogation of a Hamas terrorist, the Israel Defense Forces said that fighter jets bombed a Hamas location located on the roof of a building in the Gaza Strip, as well as a tunnel adjacent to the building. In fact, the IDF reported that its ground forces engaged in combat with armed Hamas terrorists in the Strip today, finding tunnels, seizing weapons and intelligence materials, and killing numerous of them. The IDF actions of today were notable for their efficiency and quick turnaround. The IDF attacked some 120 targets in the Gaza Strip today, including Hamas compounds and anti-tank launch facilities, using information gathered from terrorists who supported Iran. The terrorist organization Hamas was unable to emerge from the tunnel networks it uses to conceal itself in Gaza for a while today as a result of these crucial operations. The Israeli Defense Forces proceeded with their offensive operations in Gaza as the tunnel networks grew less active. Throughout the night, the Israel Defense Forces persisted in their ground force operation in the northern Gaza Strip. Several Hamas militants were slain in an attempted ambush of the tunnel, according to an announcement made by the IDF. The infantry and tank forces, under the command of the 460th Brigade, reportedly came across many efforts by Hamas agents to emerge from the tunnels and launch an attack on the soldiers. According to the IDF, Israeli forces found tunnels that were eventually destroyed and killed a significant number of shooters. The IDF reported that during an engagement, 15 Hamas members were engaged in combat, with the IDF's ground forces winning and heavily damaging the observation positions in the process. Although it also launched sporadic strikes in southern Gaza, the IDF focused its ground offensive on the northern part of the Gaza Strip. The Israel Defense Forces declared a nighttime targeted raid in the southern Gaza Strip to get the area ready for the following phases of the conflict. Soldiers apparently came upon a Hamas cell that was emerging from a tunnel during the raid. The Hamas terror operatives were killed by the military bombing, according to the IDF. Regarding these battles on the front lines and the present status of the war, Israeli officials issued harsh remarks. Following two days of tours of the southern and northern borders, Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant announced that he has received word from the reservists that they are prepared to fight to the death, no matter how long it takes. At a news conference, Yov Gallant claimed that every Israeli exhibited this resolve. Gallant further verified that on Shabbat, Israeli forces attacked Gaza City from both the north and the south, penetrating into urban areas and engaging in fierce combat with terrorists there. Additionally highlighting Israel's lack of enthusiasm for combating Hezbollah is Defense Minister Gallant. The Israeli Defense Minister did, however, emphasize that the IAF is committing the majority of its forces to any prospective developments in that area. Finally, Gallant declared that Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, would choose Lebanon's destiny if he erred and chose to go to war. Lt. Gen. Herzi Halavi, the Israeli Chief of Staff, evaluated the forces in the Gaza Strip in the interim. In an IDF-released video, Halavi is shown meeting with Brig. Gen. Itzik Cohen, the commander of the 162nd Division, and other officers who are purportedly with him. Occasionally, 
Israeli officials bring up Iran's use of terror proxies in the Middle East during these discussions. Despite their denials, it is well known that Iran supports terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah in their efforts to carry out terrorist acts in the area. How are the current policies of Iran coming along? Iranian officials have issued dire warnings, claiming that Israel has breached red lines and that a regional conflict in the Middle East is imminent. President Ibrahim Raisi stated that this might compel everyone to act. However, Iran is balancing on a razor's edge, attempting to evade a direct conflict and bending its boundaries to prevent tripping over a trap. Iran uses proxy militias from its own axis of resistance in the region to carry out limited attacks against Israel and U.S. military installations in Iraq and Syria, rather than following defined plans. The employment of Hamas and Hezbollah in Lebanon as proxies has come to define Iranian foreign policy. Iran maintains that these opposition groups operate autonomously, yet it nevertheless supports them. To what extent are the Iranian resistance forces autonomous? This dispute will never end in practice, but we have learned a great deal about Iran's behavior from it. Through its network of allies, Iran empowers, funds, and directs these terror proxies, but it rarely gives instructions. The way that Westerners understand these hierarchies is problematic. Iran's allies are like nimble but trustworthy fellow combatants. Hamas and even Hezbollah reject Iran's direct and ongoing assistance. These terrorist groups, who are Iran's allies, decide what to do during a conflict and ask for Iran's approval. Thus, it is unlikely that Hezbollah or Hamas will take any action that Iran finds objectionable. In summary, since wars tend to finish more quickly when the main adversary is neutralized, both Israel and the US should support this policy and acknowledge that Iran poses the true threat to stability in the Middle East. We appreciate you viewing us. To provide you with the quickest and most trustworthy news, we work day and night. You can click the super thanks button below to subscribe to our channel and enjoy our videos, which will ensure that you don't miss any of the videos our team has prepared, including the most recent updates and special reports on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Let's work together again soon.